Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar with the PCI Dream Team. Uh, we've gathered here today to kick off the 12-month countdown for the new technical requirements in PCI DSS 4.0 to become mandatory, and in particular to focus on the browser script requirements and the HTTP header requirements. I'm Jeff Zittermer from Human Security. I lead product management for client-side defense and PCI DSS 4.0. Uh, and let's do a bit a round of introductions. So starting with you, Art. Oh, <laughs> starting with me. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to waste a lot of time. Um, I'm Art Cooper. Everybody knows me as Coop. I've uh, been doing PCI since day one. Still love it, and um, hopefully we can uh, share some wisdom today to help folks out. That's it. Okay. On to you, Jeff Hall, the guru. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Hall. I'm also known as the PCI guru. And uh, I am with Truvanis. I've been doing it as long as Coop's been doing it. So glad to be here. Awesome. Glad to have you with us. Hey, Ben Rothke. I'm with TAPAD. Been uh, in the PCI space for about uh, two years less than Coop and, and Jeff. Um, and, you know, started the Dream Team some years ago. And uh, glad to be here today. And Day and uh, Lee, the newest member of the Dream Team, you go, and then we'll uh, finish off with David. Yeah. Hey guys, Lee Quinton um, with Trusted Sec, and just like Jeff and Coop, um, as the beard shows, I've been in this a long time. It's uh, it's accounted for every single grey hair on my chin, and <laughs> uh, I've, I've been there since uh, since the beginning as well. All yours, David. And last but not least. I would be the least yeah. of these very smart gentlemen. My name is David Munhank. I'm a principal security consultant with E-Delta Consulting. Like uh, my peers, I've been working with PCI since its inception, was actually doing payment card security before that with the SIS program with Visa. Glad to be here and thank you, Human, for inviting us. Awesome. Thank you all for, uh, for yeah, coming along for the, coming along for this. Uh, I guess I'll round it off. I've, I've been a PCI expert now for a little over a year. Um, so a little bit of catching up to do, uh, but probably spent more than is healthy on uh, just two requirements uh, and every whichever aspect of them. Um, and yeah, so for, for today, we'll, uh, we'll talk obviously about these requirements. We have a bunch of questions that we've been hearing uh, commonly come in and, uh, and especially getting more and more interesting as companies have an opportunity to start digesting these requirements. Uh, please feel free to post additional questions on LinkedIn. If we don't answer them uh, live talking about them, we will uh, answer them in line in LinkedIn. Uh, and with that, let's get started. So first off, just the basics. Does, does either you want to lay the basic foundation of what these uh, two, two new requirements, 643 and 1161, uh, are about? Yeah, I could do that. So um, you know, two years ago, uh, uh, the council unveiled uh, PCI version 4, which is a, a significant update to uh, 3.21. A, a lot of new changes, uh, but two of the bigger changes that uh, caused, uh, you know, some significant uh, concern, should we say, uh, 6.43 and 11.61, um, which um, really underscores the importance of clients, uh, client-side web security. Uh, if you're dealing with payments, um, you need to uh, really be concerned about this. Uh, 11 1161 uh, is about uh, impact of you know, like mag uh, card attacks, you know, tamper detection mechanisms. You need to be alerted about unauthorized, you know, alterations to HTTP headers, payment pages. Uh, while 643 is about, you know, the integrity of uh, payment page scripts uh, and a whole lot more. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, uh, devil you know, uh, in, in those details. And that's what uh, we're going to be talking about uh, here today, because it's it's obviously a uh, uh, significant concern to, uh, you know, pretty much everyone out there. Awesome. Thank you. And, and, and I guess to follow up on that, right? So when you say it's a concern for everyone out there, there are a lot of questions about I use an iframe from a third-party payment service provider, right? Is, is my website not descoped from uh, PCI DSS 4.0? Uh, as an example. So if you could elaborate on who actually uh, so, is under this. 
S certainly not. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, obviously, you control the access to the iframe um, when you have the website. So certainly only 643 is all about validating the authenticity and the integrity of the script that's being sent to the browser. Um, so ultimately, the buck stops with the person that's controlling access to that script. So. If you if you don't mind, I'd like to add a little historical uh, a background to this. So I've been evangelizing, evangelizing about client-side web browser vulnerabilities for years. And uh, I came up with the term, I've actually published some articles on this and some papers, came up with the term, the Mariana's Trench of Attack Surfaces. So if you folks are familiar with the Mariana Trench, it's like about 29,000 feet deep in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And for decades, they were, the scientists were trying to figure out what, what was going on down there. It wasn't until 1960 when we uh, folks got a man submersible down into the Mariana's Trench and they got visibility for the first time. So those folks who are like myself, who have an application security background and a former pen testing background, most of our efforts in the past have been focused on the server side, not the client side. <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons for that. One of which is that there's so many different versions of browsers, so many different cipher suites that can be enabled. You know, most pen testers and application security people said, I'm not touching that. There's just no way that they print enough money for us to be able to test all that. As a result, unscrupulous marketing people who would like to measure end user experience and end user telemetry, malware creators and hackers have exploited the fact that we haven't been able to see into that up until recently. Technology now exists and methodologies exist to provide visibility into that. So now I am very pleased to, to see that the PCI Council has recognized this as being something that was worthy of scrutiny and has been for some time. Now they focus their attention on, on payment pages, but I'd like to actually add that there should be scrutiny of payment re redirection pages as well, because that that's an area where there's very notable hacks and breaches and author, unauthorized breaches have occurred because of redirects to bogus payment pages that look just like the real thing. So fortunately, we now have the ability to do this. I will also say that the requirements for the PCI DSS version four don't kick in until next year, but I'm saying don't wait till then to start looking at this stuff. It's essentially, especially if you have a industrial grade payment portal page that's doing, you know, intense transactions 24 seven, you know, so working on that stuff is tantamount to working on a 747 while you're flying it. Don't, don't wait until next uh, January or February, start looking at that stuff now. And, and please let us know if you have any questions about what technologies are available to give you visibility into that, into that space. Yeah, just to underscore that point, you know, one, even, even though, you know, March, April 2025 is a year away on the calendar and in, uh, in IT time, those are, uh, you know, it's a very short amount of time and uh, the time to get working on this was last year. Um, so any company who, who's waiting until now is, is already behind the curve uh, because, uh, you know, it, it's a big deal. And if you don't understand it's a big deal, you know, that's part of the problem. I think the big thing is there needs to be a paradigm shift um, because uh, unfortunately for so long now, all of the merchants that were SAC A eligible and had payment channels that fell under the rules of SAC A um, or under the auspices, I guess, of SAC A, all of a sudden now they have to do this. And for how, how many years have they had their iframe and been going through life is good. You know, what, what, you know, I send this to CyberSource. What the hell do I care? What kind of script CyberSource is running? I could care less, you know, and what they don't understand is that's why all of the breaching is there now. We don't have physical breaching in stores other than skimmers, uh, pretty much. I mean, if there's any merchant out there that isn't protecting that card data in their physical POIs and their POSs, uh, they really have missed the boat. And so this is where the action is. This is the new frontier out here on the web. And so it's a huge paradigm change. Most of my merchants that I've had over the years, I, I, I bet all of the other QSAs on here will say the same thing. We pushed them to get point-to-point -point or end-to-end technologies on their payment devices. So we took care of that. 
or I should say they took care of that at our urging. The problem is we also pushed them over to service providers for their payment pages. I pushed my uh, merchant clients forever. But just just go with, you know, go call Braintree or whatever they are now, PayPal. Go, you know, CyberSource, Salesforce, e-commerce cloud, Shopify. Go to somebody, have them do it, and just have an iframe. Well, that was great. And now that's good, but we've got to have them do this as well. Because the bad guys figured out everybody's pushing everything to an iframe, so let's go get them. And, uh, you know, the scripting problem that 643 addresses and the Tampa protection stuff that 1161 addresses, it's very important. And so I've been trying to force that paradigm shift actually for two years. When we first started hearing about it, when 4.0 was published, I was telling my clients, you can't just wait for this. <laughs> you know? So I think that's the first step is the paradigm shift. Once you get them to understand, yes, you have to do this. Then the next step is, and you need to do it now. <laughs> I think and, and, to, to be fair, I mean, I, I, I remember when we were doing review board calls when Sakai first came out and we all kind of looked at this and thought, no scanning, no, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I own that, web server i decide where everything goes so um it, you know something was going to have to come down the pipe at some point that's right well and that was always the complaint we all had about saqa yeah. it was grandfathered in because we had all those those service providers that were selling people oh this is out of scope for visa and mastercard and then pci rolled around in 2006 yeah. and they all got a look at saqa and got their chain yanked over it and then screamed about you know everything that was in it and it's always been a laggard is i mean i blogged about it years ago about yeah. it's a joke um it's it's still a joke and it'll continue to be a joke we all want it to go away and saqaep replace it all but who knows if that'll happen okay yeah so saqa does have at least a, a shrunk down at least some baseline at least some things there i guess it's a i guess it's progress uh, compared to what you were describing uh, some of you from a couple years back uh, i'd i'd like to follow up or move on next to one of the points right there's we're literally at the 12 month mark for by when people companies have to have something in space and you said they have to start now what would you what would be your guidance about where to start like what should, should they be thinking about is it just deploying technology do we need to get other stakeholders in the room write our companies like procedures of how we're going to deal with all this how would a, like kind of where should they start what should they be doing over the next 12 months well, that's why that's why we're on this webinar with you folks, because you're one of the companies that can help them out with this, that the, where they need to start is they need to get the technology rolling. And so uh, human is one of the companies, um, you know, we're not here to endorse your product. You've been so grateful as to invite us. But, you know, we've we've actually been holding webinars with all of the companies that provide there are, there are kind of four that rose to the top. And the reason we're doing it is, you know, the Dream Team's whole mission is to get information out there to help this uh, community of ours, this payment card community. And so they need to start with a company like you folks uh, that does this. Um, there are others, but you guys are sponsoring us today. So go to Human. You know, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I say that uh, they need to start going to uh, a company that can help them with this technology. Um, and. You know, if they if it's one of my clients, I'm very fair about this, uh, Jeff. I give them the names of all four of those companies I, I mentioned earlier, uh, because those are the ones that the, that the dream team we have kind of looked at. And we sort of we, we, we realize these, these are the companies that will help you out. And they need to do that first. As far as the processes and procedures that they need to put in place, that's not going to be that difficult because in looking at the technology that all four of these companies uh, have provided, including your company, uh, most of the work is uh, is in the uh, in the technology. Uh, thank God, and uh, that's good. But they need to get that role, and then they can sit down and you know start putting together their processes and policies around it to make sure that what they're doing is keeping them 
in line with those requirements. That's the thing that's important is that you're doing what those two requirements say you're doing. Uh, you don't just have the technology and say, we're done. <laughs> I think from a planning perspective, I think it's a good idea to take a to, to take a little step back and look at your environment and just understand, I mean, how dynamic is it from a payment standpoint? Yeah. How many dynamic pages have you got that um, that rely on payment page scripts? Um, is there any kind of gamification in your shopping experience? You know, are you offering more um, as you're moving through the checkout process? Do you continue to offer more goods for purchase along the way until you actually get to the checkout piece i mean how many things are potentially imply um through throughout the, the the process from the point at which that that consumer on their browser is going to um be providing their 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 account data um i mean look i mean if you're if you're small you've got a single page and that's it um, you know, you're a you're a tiny e-commerce presence. You're a mom and pop. You got you know, you're not doing too many transactions. Sure, I mean, if you if you hire someone who can look at you, maybe write you a content security policy if they understand what SRI is and get that implemented. Understood. But even the council accept the fact that if you look at the guidance column of the DSS itself, the last bullet on six four three talks about proprietary uh, proprietary script or tag management systems and that's exactly what human is so like you know mid, mid mid to larger organizations that have got a lot more a uh, lot more moving parts in the equation i think they're going to really benefit from uh, from the solutions that have come on come on the market over the last couple of years you know lee makes a great point or several great points back in the day most most website pages were incredibly static and they no matter how many times you hit them they basically were the same now, with all the intelligence that's being gathered from the web browser, business intelligence, you know, telemetry, end user stuff, the more they learn about you, it, the, the more the possibility or probability is that every time you log in, they're going to be presenting different stuff to you. And that's why we need some kind of technology that is aware of that, can monitor that, flag those scripts, flag those tag managers and reach out to third and fourth parties and, and, and identify what's going on because if you can't see it, you can't stop it. Yeah, to, to Jeff's question is, you know, how should a company approach it? It's relatively straightforward, you know, uh, read the PCI DSS. It's uh, astounding how many people have not read it in detail and you can't read it just once. You have to read it numerous times. Uh, in this, you know, almost memorize 6.43 and 11.61, then look in your environment, really understand it well. And then, you know, do a gap, you know, understand, you know, are you in scope? You know, what do you need to do? Um, and as Lee said is, yeah, there are, you know, simple small doctor's offices that are not uh, that complex, but most medium sized organizations have connections, applications, multiple applications, so much they don't know about. So do that gap analysis and you, then you'll have a roadmap exactly uh, what you need to do. And so you have to, you know, take that step back, understand, and then go and try to fix what's there. But if you just sort of throw consultants at the problem without understanding what your exact uh, scope is and what your uh, what exactly needs to be done, you know, you're just gonna be racking up the bills, but you're not gonna be uh, compliant with, uh, you know, 6.43, 11.61. Well, and, and that's something people have to remember about what the council did. The the standards are written so that people don't have to go out and buy a tool. You can technically meet these two requirements with a good content security policy. Um, I, I've been dealing with a lot of companies of late looking at content security policies and some are better than others, but at the end of the day, this is like, when when did they introduce the requirement on logging? Does anybody remember? Yeah, and, I remember. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, everybody ran out and seam sales went through the roof. This is the same thing you don't have to have a, a yeah. logging solution. Well, you do now under version four, 
It's mandated. This is where this is going to head in the future. Today, you can get away with a content security policy. Down the road, Who knows? probably not. Could, yeah. Could I mean, you, yeah. It's a good point, Jeff, and it's a good analogy. Um, as I say, you know, now we're in that situation now with logging where we've got a future daily requirement for next year that um, daily log reviews, no, thing of the past. You've got to have no. an automated solution that's, right. that's going that's right. to review your logs and alert you based on correlated events. That's right. What everybody was event. doing anyway, right, Lee? But now yeah. they've made them do it. That, that's it. That's it. You know, any, anyone of any reasonable <laughs> size was doing it anyway. No, no right. one's going to see it. No one can sit there and review all of the potential. Not at all. Come out of even a even a small environment. No, it's um, ridiculous. It's too many, too many going to hit you. It's like the content security policy. It's the same thing. Are you going to hire five minions as a former minion? I, I I wouldn't apply for that job. And the other yeah. and the other thing you have to think about too is um, with the 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 rapid speed that the scripts change and. And if you, you put you put Google Analytics in, it pulls in 900 uh, scripts. Uh, when Jeff was demoing his product to us, you know, it's, it's scary, uh, the scripting. Thing. But, you know, this has been the history of PCI. In the first versions, it said, you need FIM software, something like Tripwire. They actually mentioned Tripwire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure my buddies, uh, I'm sure Gene Kim and, and love you guys. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the Tripwire guys loved it. But, unfortunately... Uh, they can't come out. That's for the same reason why we couldn't say for requirement five, if you're running Windows, we had to say systems that were, you know, susceptible to malware, commonly, commonly affected by malware, which was just PCI speak for Windows. And, you, you know, so they have to be careful and they can't force you to use a certain OS or a certain tool. Uh, but but Lee's point is perfect. I, I, I had a couple of clients in the beginning that literally were trying to manually look at logs. And this was back like 2006-ish. And I said, can't be done. Knock it off. And I forced them to get something. I don't know. In the beginning, what were we pushing them to? Like Q Radar or some of that stuff? I, I don't remember exactly. Log, but log rhythm. Log, log rhythm, rhythm is, yeah. Uh, log log analyzer. Site. Event or, analyzer. Not arc site. Arc uh, something. Yeah, there, there was Arcsite. Arcsite did do oh, it. Oh, Arcsite. Oh, my God. Remember that? But that you, was horrible. But you, yeah. would, uh, you, you literally had to give your firstborn child and, uh, oh. and, and your right leg every year. But, um, yeah. but it was the Cadillac of solutions. Yeah, it was a Cadillac, had, all right. It had <laughs> signatures for everything. That's yeah. why people loved it. Yeah, it, it was like that. Uh, it was, yeah. It's like when Oracle comes into your environment. You know, you just oh, you yeah. have to go and kiss the Larry Ellison statue. It's, it's, I mean, once once Oracle comes in, that's it. The Oracle now owns you. I've always said their logo should be like a big eye that says F you. Uh, anybody from Oracle? Sorry, guys. I've been around too long. I've seen you guys destroy people's environments. You come in and then everything is Oracle and every port and every service and every everything has to be opened. Oh, we need all oh, those ports open re immediately. Remember, remember Oracle's virtual box? Oh, my God. Yeah, I remember how long it, but I did we complain about the fact that the beauty of VirtualBox was if you were truly into the total Oracle solution, VirtualBox would tell you where everything was running virtually. <laughs> it it hid nothing like VMware, and it was it was an it was a pen tester's dream scenario. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, they also had their uh, unbreakable uh, campaign like 15 years ago, which uh, just showed how breakable Oracle really is. So. Yeah. That was a funny campaign. You remember that? I mean, it was how long did it take? I mean, th th this, we got to stop slamming Oracle. Oracle, we love you. We understand. Yeah. There's a place for you. But you guys, you guys were all database heads. None of you had a clue about security in the beginning. I know that you do now. And so we say it all tongue and jest. I should probably announce here that we all work for different companies, and these are our opinions. Um, we're all a bunch of old, opinionated geezers, so we'll we'll say things like that, but uh, we don't want anyone to get upset, and certainly uh, my company isn't saying Oracle's bad or anything like that. It's just that there's such a history there, and the same with logging and seam, and there's going to be a history with this, and SAC-A has had that storied history. Jeff, uh, 
uh, Hall brought up the, the point in the beginning, all this QSAs, we looked at SAC A and, and we said, what? I mean, I, I had one client that everybody knows you've sat in their buildings. And the bottom line is when they decided to do uh, e-payments way back when the only thing was a SAC A, we sat down, they understood, they even understood, this isn't very secure, Coop, is it? No. And so we built out a payments DMZ, I mean, back then. And I mean, I'm talking many years ago, we built out a payments DMZ and we locked it down. And then we moved everything from the back end of it over to the point where nothing but that iframe would get served up off that DMZ. And so it was kind of an offshoot from the main payment page. So we were sort of building uh, what most people do now, but we were building it on a large scale and we were applying all of the PCI requirements in existence. That was like version two or yeah, it was version two then. And we applied all of those requirements to that DMZ and locked it down. Um, and, you know, that was probably the best you could do. Uh, but it wasn't mandated and it wasn't like I could tell them they had to. This particular client just understood that if I just do SAC A and I just do an iframe redirect, somebody could get on there, couldn't they? You know, and then I, and I used, you know, how do you answer that? Couldn't they? Of course they could. Um, so this is a long time coming. And I'm personally, I'm proud of the fact that the SSC did put these requirements in and did put them over on SAC A and not just leave them on the uh, primary requirements for somebody doing a ROC or a SAC D, you know. Uh, I think we're going to see a major reduction in uh, breaching. And if any bad guys are out there watching me, you guys, we're, we're going to get you. So keep it up. You know, I mean, and this is going to be one of those steps, I think, that takes a major whack at their ability to get in behind your uh, your payment pages and do man in the middles or redirecting people to, you know, silliness. And I'm quite frankly, very proud of it. And I love that they use the word mischief now in PCI. Yep. I love that. <laughs> uh, when I worked for the council, I was probably where they got the word mischief. There was plenty of mischief coming when I was teaching QSAs, but I, I, I love that because it is mischief and it, and it's, and unfortunately um, it's mischief that leads to all kinds of financial woes and operational woes and, and loss of reputation and, and many other things. So, well, anyway. and Coop, you bring up a, you allude to a good point which is the DSS is not about security. It's, it's a bare bones foundation to get secure. But if you truly want to be secure, you got to go beyond it. You, it's just the start. And, and that's what people forget. They, they think because they get judged PCI compliant, they're secure. And that's not the case. It's it's just the ante into the game. I mean, it's a proverbial yeah. floor. It's not the ceiling. I mean, that was you're, uh, you're stealing my line now, Ben. I've been oh, saying yeah. that for years. You know, it's a. I was in the Air Force. Remember, we used to have the motto "Aim High," and I use that same motto for uh, security with PCI. PCI is the floor. Aim high. Aim for the ceiling, and don't. You know, don't think because you've met the basic criteria of PCI that you're in any way secure. If you had a, I used to do my scale talk. If you had a scale from zero to 10, where zero is absolutely no security and 10 is perfect security, PCI is probably a two. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of room in there. You got you got eight big rungs in the ladder to get yourself, you know, very secure. I, I, think, I, give, uh, it like a, I give it a bit uh, more closer to a four. Think, <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's clearly not, uh, not eight, nine, or 10. No, we'd be like skater uh, judges. We'll hold up our, our, where does it stand on the scale sign there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Go, going back to a comment that I, I think David uh, said earlier, right? Of you, you can't protect what you can't see or something of that, uh, of that nature. So I think, uh, Probably the big part of the battle that PCI is mandating and, and gets you some mileage is just being forced to have that inventory and know what's running there because that's that's you have to have that to be able to start. Uh, so I don't want to give the PCI council that much of a so much of a hard time. I think just having that is actually huge. It's up, it's not enough, and you should be doing more. and And we do offer more uh, security well beyond the compliance because we we started uh, in security, and for us the compliance okay. So we we're already secure. Now let's just 
make PCI DSS, these two new requirements that are related to our realm, let's just make those really, really easy. People need um, to understand that it's an environmental standard, Jeff. And that's the difference is a lot of people, you know, if I'm going to write a standard about just Windows point of sale systems, I could make it very pointed and marked and 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 lock it down and no no problem would ever occur. PCI is environmental. So the problem is they have to go down to the lowest performing thing uh, because they have to cover the whole environment. So if there's one little bad thing in there, it drags everything down. And that's, you know, that's that's been my argument all. I've always defended uh, them for that reason that, hey, this is an environmental standard. It's not an item standard or or rules on how to make a peanut butter sandwich, which we could really <laughs> tighten up, you know. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to go back to the um, to another comment from earlier, right? Because so you've mentioned it here, and we hear people say it, and customers who wanna or prospects who are thinking of trying it. But if I were to try to meet these requirements with just what's available, like CSP and SRI, like help me connect the dots. Like how how does CSP give me my inventory, for example, or how does it authorize at a script level uh, versus like a whole domain? And right, an SRI for assuring the integrity, it'll only assure that first script that's brought in, but not the whole supply chain of that script and all those well, that, and, that script will bring in. So what, how, how, would a, how would a merchant go about putting together a, a, a complete answer using CSP and SRI? Well, and Jeff, that's, that's the thing. The CSP is kind of like a, a brute force type of action, but the, the council can't go out and just mandate a tool. Um, look how long it's taken them to finally get around to mandating a seam. Although everybody knew a seam had to be used. I mean, there was no other way to get the work done. This is the same problem. So you're going to see people use CSPs probably for even the first time in a lot of cases. And yeah, they work. They're kind of sort of brutish in the way they get it done. And what people are going to find is, is they need a tool that can do the nuance as opposed to the sledgehammer type approach. Yeah. And even, even more so when you start thinking about 1161, um, I mean, it's, it's easy to look at say, oh, change in, a change in tamper, change detection, tamper, and anti-tamper mechanisms and think, oh, you know, well, okay. Well, if I take all my payment page scripts in and I log that in my um, FIM tool, that should be enough. Except the requirements actually asking, this goes back to Ben's point of, um, you know, merchants and service providers really need to read the DSS more than once when these new releases come out, because the, the the crux of it is, is you need to be comparing the contents of HTTP headers with the payment page script. Um, and uh, sure, you know, you could, I mean, it, I mean, the DSS gives some bullet guidance to it about, you know, looking for violations of the content security policy um, and reporting on those, maybe changes to the CSP itself might indicate that some tampering has taken place. But as soon as you get on to the rest of the guidance about external monitoring of systems um, and, you know, analyzing uh, received web pages, embedding tamper resistant tamper detection scripts in the payment page, using reverse proxies or CDNs, um, all of these other things, it's um, now you are moving towards a paid model, no matter what way you look at it. Someone's, you know, you're gonna have to pay someone for something. Um, and ultimately, humans tall, the, the, you know, the other three organizations as well. Um, it addresses both controls. It's and tough though to do that. It, 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 it will be tough. I think it probably in the, in the first, first pass, it will be harder probably to meet 1161 than it will to meet 643. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It's going to be tough. And, and and the thing is, we all know our clients. I mean, you know, we, we've had clients over the years. I have many clients. They're real good at making rubber baby buggy bumpers. But uh, when it comes to IT, 
No. In fact, half the time their webpage for making rubber baby buggy bumpers and buying them is down. And why is that? Because they're not good at IT. And that and that's the sad truth of the matter. Now, large organizations that have very uh, mature, experienced IT teams, they could certainly pursue it in that manual way. But I'll tell you what, um, I've spoken to some folks at some really large merchants, not just the ones that I deal with, but some other ones. And yeah, they don't want to mess though, with it. Yeah, they're, they're, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They don't want to mess with it. They'd rather have a tool like this where it makes it simple and they can automatically go in and see, oh, man, look at this. This look, What the hell is this script? You know, where'd this I've, come from? You know, I've been doing... Well, I've been, it's and, just and that's the doing. problem. These these analytic environments change hourly. You know, yes, it's do. not like they change in a month or a week. I mean, Google can implement a change today, right now. And how do you, maybe it's something you don't want. And how do you stop it? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I've been, I've been doing a gap in fact, for the last couple of weeks with a large organization who, you know, they, they aggregate multiple brands um, under their own umbrella. Um, and they advertise all of these brands through one e-commerce portal, um, which will condense down into obviously fewer payment pages, but um, it's, they're far more likely will, even though they have, they have a very mature team, mature processes, great layered security from the outside all the way in. They're using a CDN for their presentment piece. Um, and uh, they're still probably going to be looking at uh, looking at tools and solutions to, to meet these two. Absolutely. Because it's, ultimately, you need to be able to not only do it, run it, keep it moving, account for dynamics in the, in the environment. You need to be able to prove it as well. To the likes that, of us. And that's and that's the hard part, I think, if they do it yeah. manually, because then it's you know it's it's the proverbial evidence on a napkin, right? So they, <laughs> yeah. you know, they they show me a picture of it, or or um, and it's not that as a QSA we immediately uh, distrust uh, some of that type of evidence, but um, trust, it, trust but verify, isn't it? trust but verify. And the thing is, if the breach, if if a breach occurs, then that proof isn't going to hold up and. And that's you know that's that's another a great aspect of these tools like Human and and the other uh, companies because not only do they protect you, but you've got some proof. You also have the historical, which I think is going to be very important uh, after a breach. And that's that's something that their chances are they won't have if they're doing it themselves. That's for sure because the historical part I've testified actually <laughs> several times. Um, and I actually got to sit in the chair that Cato Kalin sat in during the OJ trial in the exact same OJ room. So I figured that's it. I've lived my life. That's it. I've done it. But I had to testify against a company there that was misleading somebody. And, you know, when the rubber hits the road, if you don't have something that you can show to a jury to prove exactly what you've done, um, it doesn't look good for you. You know. Well, and, and you're talking about evidence, Coop, and I, over the last three weeks, I've had three encounters with clients saying, how can we reduce the amount of log data that we're, that we're collecting? And, and I get the, the rationale for it. I mean, they're sucking up lots of disk space. I mean, log data does that. I, but I always explain to people that, you know, log data is the flight data recorder of your environment. And when, when the shit hits the fan, if you don't have that data, you're going to be kicking yourself all around the room over the fact that, well, you know, we didn't think it was important at the time. Well, yeah, it wasn't important until you had that breach. And now all of a sudden you need that data to know how and why it happened and you don't have it. And, you know, this is the same problem. 
you know, these tools are going to generate that data that'll allow you to go back and figure out how what had happened and where the where the script came from that caught you. A CSP may or may not do that for you. Well, my recommendation is, you know, I've, I've actually worked a lot with development teams and QA test people in the past and, and, and counsel them on the secure software development lifecycle stuff, threat modeling and all that. Essentially, what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to build this testing process and this technology in, into their SDLC. So as developers are developing, they can quickly test with some of this technology. When it's ready to go out the door, obviously they do pen testing and the application vulnerability scans. Part of the process is going to be, okay, let's look at what, what's happening with the scripts. And if they build that in and they make it a repeatable, duplicatable process, then they should be okay. Now there's a real time element to this as well. Obviously the SDLC is before you go to production, but in production, you want to be constantly monitoring what's happening to the scripts and, and the headers as well. And um, once again, technology like human and some of the other uh, companies out there will help you do that. And that way you can also build that into your incident response procedures. What will, what say you, you detect some significant change to how your payment page or payment redirect page is handling tags and third party and fourth party sources and all that kind of stuff. If you could detect that in real time, it can trigger alarms. Some of the technology I've seen can actually block the attacks as well as alert on them. So uh, there's there's a two pronged approach I think in the SDLC and then into you know real time monitoring and production. I think the funny you know, thing is that if they get a demo from any of those uh, four companies, including Human, that you know you guys that are listening here, you need to get demos from from uh, from Jeff here and and when he shows you what you got going on you don't even know what's on your own payment pages uh you think you do but you don't you don't have a clue and when you see uh you know I think that that's <laughs> part of the wake up call that goes along with that paradigm shift and then then you understand that what Mr. Munhank just said is very important it needs to be part of your SDLC because if you're developing trash you're putting trash out you're in big trouble and 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 I think that's another big paradigm shift because most developers that did payment stuff, they're just like, well, I know the code to get the iframe out there. I don't, I don't, what do I care? <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, I, think, I, I just dealt with a client here recently where they've been doing SAQA for years and I'm looking through this one piece. They have four different, ways a payment can serve up online. And one of them was serving up scripting language. It wasn't SAQA, it was AEP. And I'm watching it run and I'm going, guys, this is not in the criteria for SAQA. You're actually doing SAQA EP here. Well, you know, how many people are running around out in the world have been doing SAQA all these years, and lo and behold, they don't even meet the criteria for it. So, I mean, there's that kind of stuff going on. But going back to, to Coop's comment um, regarding, you know, and David's comment about development, it's not a lot of times the developer's fault. It's the marketing people. They sign a contract with Google, with Meta, with Pick Your Poison, and all of a sudden scripts are being injected that IT had no knowledge about what was going on, all yeah. for the sake of, you know, we can get analytics or SEO or whatever the latest acronym is for the marketing folks. And so as a result, we end up in this situation and all we can do from an IT perspective is react to it, go to a human, go to somebody and get a protection to keep us from, from getting, getting hacked. 
Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank oh. I was just going to say exactly that. I mean, bottom line is, I mean, if we're talking about SDLC and, and, and the considerations all the way through from development, it's requirement 621. It's in there. You need to be incorporating um, information security issues during each stage of your software development life cycle. It's, it's a requirement. So you know, people should be take advantage of um, PCI software security framework. Take a look at that. Look at NIST, ISO, look at safe code. You know, there's, um, th th there are good examples out there to, to, to build, to build it. In. Yeah, that's a good point, Lee, because, um, yeah, you know, back in the day when everybody's doing waterfall, it's very easy to understand. Okay. At every phase of the development cycle, we have to incorporate security elements. Yep. Well, nobody's doing waterfall anymore. People it, are doing and extreme programming. So Microsoft has a very good, like called the Microsoft SDLs, Secure Development Lifecycle. They have a model for Agile as well. Yep. And if you check, check the diagram, you'll see that it, only in certain phases, you know, if you're doing sprints and all that stuff, there's no step-by-step -step process. But they have identified various phases of an Agile Lifecycle where you should incorporate security and they make recommendations on what to do and that includes threat modeling and, and some of the other stuff if you're if you're writing payment page scripts for your web app you're doing development and you're governed it has to be how you're doing it needs to be governed by your sdlc and subsequently 621 applies the same way that 643 does and that you have to be considering information security along the way. So, all so most of these controls are mutually exclusive, but they all kind of hold each other's hands along the way to to help support and drive um, compliance with the standard as you go. So, I mean, they've been deliberately written this way. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of guidance out there for it. So, people should avail themselves of it. Yeah, and it goes back to read it, like Ben was saying. Uh, read it, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, go the, get it and read it. <laughs> the guidance yeah. column is pretty good now. Yes, it is. It's very yeah, good. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing, you know. If if you want to buy an ISO standard and other standards, it's you know one hundred fifty, two hundred dollars. You know, you know everything on the council website is free. So read it, understand it, um, and it's important. Also, is you're dealing with the QSA, and the QSA knows PCI well but they don't understand your environment. And so really it is a, it should be a cooperative uh, relationship is the better you understand your environment, the better you understand the PCI requirement, the better compliance is. Absolutely. Well, and, and I've been referring people to the secure SLC standard yeah. for development. I mean, you read that thing and it's it's not a long standard. I mean, for for a standard, it's actually probably pretty brief. But if you want to develop secure, solid software that's going to protect data, I can't think of a better way to go about it than to refer refer to that standard and use it. Yep. Yeah, there's no shortage of documentation. There's no shortage of tools. You know, companies really need to, you know, get in front of the plate and uh, find the yeah. right one. And once again, this, you know, these things take time also. Even, you know, if someone decides today they want to, uh, you know, use the, the, you know, human's approach. I mean, by the time you get, uh, you know, management approval, you get finance, negotiate contracts, that's six months right there. So... Once again, is you know um, compliance is a year away, but let's get rolling. <laughs> yeah, so, you know time is relative, and that uh, one year in PCI is like sort of uh, you know next week. That's right. Everybody on this call should be contacting Jeff for a demo or going to Just actually. Don't. I say they should go to all four of the companies, get the demos, and, yeah. and see the one you like, and or you know what whatever. I, I mean, the thing is. Um, and I've told the folks over at Source Defense, this, Jay Scrambler. I've told the folks here at Human and the Fruit folks, this is this is a uh, um, uh, this is a going to be a large playing field, and there's a lot of room for all of these guys, and that's what's good. They're, this this is not a tight uh, little area. This is the breaching ground. <laughs> so there's you know there's a lot of room out there, and I you know and merchants should get smart. Do it now, like you said, six months. 
Um, and every month they push it out, it's just another month where then they're going to be scrambling. And uh, this, they don't this need is, to do this it. Is the vector. This is the vector they're going after. Yeah, that's right. This, they this, are this going after it. They're looking at now. Um, Absolutely. It's, um, card present has been sewn up now with, um, you know, with, with, with the advent of P2PE and um, we're protecting the transmission pieces, things getting encrypted at swipe, um, tap or dip. But then, you know, we've got EMV as well and uh, that, that's pushing out further. Um, fine gas pump skimmers are always going to be a, um, a, a thing, I guess, um, to some degree. It's a little bit easier to do it than when you're in there on a counter playing with a POI. Um, but card not present transactions, that's what they're going to go after if they can. Yeah, that's what EMV did. It just moved... Uh... Moved everything online, so it, it moved, uh, moved, the, moved the goalposts and changed, changed the changed the, changed the play. They they threw a flag. That's right. Didn't they? That's right. <laughs> it did. It really did. EMV just, combined with point to point is just like it's 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 literally bulletproof. Did did anybody else when remember when Amex Blue came out with the chip back in two thousand two? Did anybody get one and get the card reader, the chip reader? Yeah, I got one, and and there were like Amazon, and I can't remember. There were like two websites that, that would work with it, and I thought that was going to be the future, and boy, did it die like a rock. Right. <laughs> well, you know what's sad is, um, yeah, it died like a rock, but, you know, the U.S. government has a card, and I don't know if they still call it the CAC card the cac card but when i was getting out of the air force my last year was 96 early 96 and we were bringing this online and i thought this damn thing is cosmic because our id cards were little pieces of plastic with paper in it laminated and look real good and official but you could make one in 10 minutes so they came out with this cat card and on this cat card i had to go uh and and i think they they had our blood typing on there and a couple of things. But the, the thing that was so cool is it had a chip. And all government computers were going to get this a chip reader. And I actually saw a few before I got out where to get onto the system, you had to put your card in there and it would read your chip. And I've seen it when I've been down to the VA a couple of times. I've seen it. So maybe it, you know, some variation of it still exists. And from a physical point of view, yeah, that Amex Blue made perfect sense. But the logistics of it was something that I can see why it, you know, it went bye bye. But but well, you know that that's the point. All these things we've done over the years, the 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 ding dongs that commit the mischief, they figure it out. And the, you know, and right now we're at the precipice of this. This is this is the frontier. The card not present, the ecom stuff. Uh, Jeff's company, Human. You know, you guys and these other companies. You guys are standing up here at the forefront of it, and. Um, you know, it, there has to be there has to be uh, a line drawn in the sand with these idiots. And you know, all the merchants that are out there listening, if you're going to draw that line, if you choose to do it yourself, great. But it sure isn't going to hurt to get a demo from these other companies. Um, I put the companies in the chat. I know Jeff doesn't mind if I say them all. Human is one. J Scrambler, Source Defense, for Root. Those are the four that we know now. And, and, you know, like I said, we've been, as the Dream Team, we've been giving all of you guys equal time. We feel that all of you guys can help the merchants out there. And so that's our advice, and that's why we're doing this, is please get a hold of these companies, starting with Human if you want to or any of the others, and see what they have and start looking at it. Because as Ben said, NIT, this is a year is a like a blip. And... You can't just keep sitting around here waiting. If you've got a payment page, get rolling. <laughs> awesome. Th thanks. Thanks for the uh, yeah. All the all the plugs for human, and then like pu pulling together a few of the less threads that we talked about. Right. So obviously, developing securely is very important, and and a bit to that point of how the different requirements match. Right. Uh, we have some of our existing customers, they're on their security team and they don't have necessarily good communication to know what their developers are doing when and how. So they like that we look at what's happening in the actual browser and just give them the telemetry uh, of, okay, here's what is actually happening from their own developers, but more importantly, all the third parties that just bypass all of these other controls that you have for secure lifecycle and, uh, and 
security checks in the CI/CD pipeline and and all that. Um, and the, right, it go, the scripts go from third parties and fourth parties you've never met, all directly into the browser. And so the only place you can find them is if you're looking at what's happening over there versus checking uh, what are your developers up to. And uh, sim very similar thing for headers, right? So we said the 1161 may actually be the harder one. Uh, and, and I think that's true. So a lot of companies use uh, both CSP and, and somebody like us and a few other security headers. They're all, I think, an important part of the toolbox. But then in a lot of cases, again, they don't have a way to monitor is the CSP that's supposed to be there actually there? Is it tight enough? Uh, has it been changed, uh, right? Like a, even a developer in-house could potentially just turn off the CSP, move it from enforce to report mode, for example, and not and because they tried to make something work and then they forgot it in that state. Uh, so we discover those uh, security headers and present them in the browser and then send alerts if there are new headers that you haven't authorized before. And we'll show you a diff between that header and the old header. And now you have something with which to go back to the uh, development team if that communication didn't happen in advance uh, and say, hey, did, did we make this change? Why is this authorized? And then, yeah, you can check it as authorized or say, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and fix that. Uh, so with that, I think we're, we're really nearing the end here. Uh, I haven't really been able to see if there's uh, questions on LinkedIn, but if so, thank, uh, thanks for everyone who submitted them. Uh, and thanks for all of, uh, for all of you on, uh, uh, on the PCI Dream Team. I think we have a couple of minutes just if, uh, if people want to get in uh, uh, parting thoughts or comments. Uh, and and then one we'll thing also, you know, people have questions, uh, email PCI Dream Team at gmail.com and uh, we'll do our best to... Uh, yeah. In answer. Absolutely. Uh, Alexa just posted the uh, the link to learn more about how human can help you, and um, and that's good information. And 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 again, um, I really want to say thank you, uh, Jeff, to you folks, um, and and uh, thank you for setting up this webinar for us because it's just a way for us to get the word out. That's we're just five old geezers that want to help and. Yep. Yeah, we're just evangelists. Uh, somebody once told me that I go at PCI like a Southern preacher, I, you know, and, and probably I do uh, because it's so easy, in my opinion, to do it and then not have to worry about the bad guys and the mischief. I agree with I agree with Reverend Coop. <laughs> yes. So I have a uh, favorite saying, and that's uh, a rising tide floats all boats. The PCI Dream Team is not just comprised of us five crusty old farts. The PCI Dream Team is a community. It's not just us, but it's everybody out there on this call, those who attend our webinars, anybody who cares about payment card security. And that should be just about everyone because all of us carry at least one payment card. And, and it hits you right where you live, right in your wallet. So, uh, but once again, thanks to Human and, and thanks to the community that is the PCI Dream Team. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so yeah, true. with that, uh, yeah, additional questions. So you you heard it here. Email the PCI Dream Team, or you can continue to post those on the uh, in, in the LinkedIn, and we we will uh, get to answering uh, all of those. Uh, thank you all for joining. Again, tw twelve months to go. So uh, please give us a call or give some of our competitors a call. Plenty of uh, solutions out there. Uh, you're not alone in this. Nope. No. Nope. Thank you. Yep. Thanks Thank much. you much. Thank you. Thank you.